Hello boys and girls, this is Dr. Teresa, and today we're gonna to go into the cardiovascular system. So if you remember from one of our previous lectures, the cardiovascular system includes the heart and the blood vessels. The circulatory system is heart, blood vessels, and the blood. The major divisions of the circulatory system are the pulmonary circuit, which is the right side of the heart, which carries blood to the lungs and back to the heart. And then there's the systemic circuit, which is the left side of the heart. This side supplies blood to all the tissues of the body and returns it to the heart. So in that systemic circuit, again, left side of the heart, this guy carries the fully oxygenated blood. <clears throat> and arise from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. This blood is sent to all the organs of the body via the aorta. In that pulmonary circuit, which is the right side of the heart, this is the lesser oxygenated blood, or we like to say dirty blood, that arrives from the IVC and the CVS. This is inferior vena cava and superior vena cava. So the blood is sent to the lungs via the pulmonary trunk. So the heart is located in the mediastinum. Remember, that's one of the body cavities, and it's between the lungs. The base, wide superior portion of the heart and blood vessels uh, which attach here. The apex is the inferior end which tilts to the left and tapers to a point. So here's a um, transverse section of the body so you can kind of like see inside. Left ventricle, uh, intraventricular septum, you can kind of see that that heart muscle cut right in half and you can identify some of um, the structures from this view in a little bit different of a way. So we're going to go into the gross anatomy of the heart and you'll be able to trace the blood flow uh, after we're done. Okay, so when we're talking about the heart muscle, the wall of the heart, the pericardium is the double-walled sac or the pericardial sac that encloses the heart. This allows the heart to beat without friction. It's anchored to the diaphragm inferiorly and the sternum anteriorly. The parietal pericardium is the outer wall of that sac. Remember, those serous membranes, we have a parietal portion uh, and a visceral portion. So on the parietal pericardium, that's that outer wall that's uh, closer to the body wall, superficial fibrous layer of connective tissue. This is deep, thin, serous layer. The visceral pericardium, also known as the epicardium, covers the surface of the heart adipose and thick layer in some places and the coronary blood vessels will travel through this layer. The pericardial cavity is the space inside the pericardial sac and it's filled with 5 to 30 milliliters of pericardial fluid. Pericarditis, there's an itis, inflammation of the membranes that uh, may be uh, painful because it's a painful friction rub with each heartbeat. So here's a picture, we've seen this picture before, probably last semester, where we can see how the um, membrane attaches, the layers of the heart muscle in and of itself, and that pericardial um, membrane. So we can see the pericardial cavity, which would include the fluid. We can see the sac, which uh, has fibrous layers on the outside, the parietal layer, we have the serous layer, then we have the epicardium. The heart muscle in and of itself, you can see the myocardium, which is the heart muscle, the endocardium, which is that interior portion, and then the epicardium, and then also that pericardial sac. So the myocardium is that layer of cardiac muscle. The muscle spirals around the uh, heart, which produces a ringing motion. Has a fibrous skeleton, of, the, or is the fibrous skeleton of the heart. It's the framework uh, of collagenous and elastic fibers throughout the myocardium. It provides structural support and attachment for cardiac muscle and anchors for the valves. Electrical insulation between the atria and the ventricles. It's important in timing and coordination of contractile activity. 
That endocardium, endo meaning on the inside, is that smooth inner lining of the heart and blood vessels. It covers the valve surfaces and is continuous with the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. <clears throat> okay, this is a neat picture of the spiral orientation of that myocardial muscle and how, it's, how that tissue actually arranges itself. Okay, the heart chambers. I don't know if this is a review for many of us, but um, the heart does have four chambers. It has right and left side and top and bottom portions. The top chambers are called the atria or atrium, and the bottom chambers are the ventricles. So the right and left atria, these are the two superior chambers. They receive blood returning to the heart, whether it's clean or dirty blood. The articles uh, enlarge, are in a large chamber. Right and left ventricles, two inferior chambers that pump blood into arteries. So on this picture, we can make some identifications. We can see um, the right atria. We can see the tricuspid valve, which is located on the right side of the heart between the right atria and the right ventricle. Within that right ventricle, we can see that leaving that ventricle, um, before blood would leave that ventricle, it has to go through what we call a semilunar valve, which we'll get into in a minute, and that is one of the pulmonary valves. Um, it leaves that chamber through the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary artery. <clears throat> the, then we can see from this view uh, the left atrium and the left ventricle separated by the bicuspid valve. When it blood leaves the left ventricle, it's gonna exit through the aorta. Okay, let's break this down a little further. The atrioventricular sulcus separates the atria and ventricles. The intraventricular Sulcus overlies the interventricular septum that divides the right ventricle from the left. The sulci contain the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries, we'll get into that system uh, later on so you understand that a little bit better. But this is the outside you know, portion. This is how the, um, when we're talking about the coronary arteries, that's how the heart muscle itself gets its own blood supply to keep the tissue nourished. Okay, so here we can see on a heart specimen, the anterior interventricular sulcus, denoted by that pink line, and then we can see the coronary sulcus. There's that word uh, sulcus again, right? We saw that it, when we did the neuro portion last semester and we talked about the brain, the gyri and the sulcus. So the sulcus are those grooves. Here's the posterior interventricular sulcus and the posterior coronary sulcus. Okay, the chambers of the heart. Again, this is just from an external portion, so you can kind of get your head wrapped around orientation. We can see um, uh, we're looking at the back side, therefore uh, it's oriented as it would sit within your chest, sort of, so you can see where everything lies. Okay, the interatrial septum is that wall that separates the atria. Just take that word apart and you can tell where it is. The pectinate muscles, these are internal ridges of myocardium in right atrium and both auricles. The intraventricular septum is the muscular wall that separates ventricles. The trabeculae carnae are internal ridges in both ventricles. And we're gonna keep like looking at this, these pictures on this one, we can see the evidence of the pectinate muscles. The valves. Valves ensure a one-way flow of blood through the heart, and that's why it's so important. 
So the atrioventricular valves or the AV valves, look at the word, they're between the atrium and the ventricles. They control blood flow between the atrium and the ventricle. The right AV valve has three cusps. We call it the tricuspid valve. The left one is the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. So if you have a heart murmur, that is also classified as a mitral valve prolapse. It's when this valve does not close completely. The chordae tendineae, these are cords that connect the AV valves to the papillary muscles on the floor of the ventricles. This prevents the AV valves from flipping inside out or bulging into the atria when the ventricles contract. The semilunar valves, these guys control the flow into the great arteries. They open and close because of blood flow and pressure created by those ventricles. The pulmonary semilunar valve in the opening between the right ventricle and pulmonary trunk, the aortic semilunar valve is the opening between the left ventricle and the aorta. So pulmonary semilunar valve, semilunar, that should give you the, the indicator just by the words that it looks like a half moon. Okay, that's um, one way to determine or be able to identify that. That pulmonary semilunar valve, right side between right ventricle and pulmonary trunk, aortic semilunar valve, left side between the left ventricle and the aorta. Okay, here's a, um, again, a transverse section of the heart muscle. So you can look, kind of look down into it and see why it is called what it is. Here we have um, the evidence of the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. <clears throat> we can kind of see those chordae tendinae, how they come down and they're going to connect and anchor into the uh, musculature of the heart. And then the, the big difference here is evidenced in this view between that style of a valve and the aortic and pulmonary valves. Different functions, right? So thereby they have to be built a little differently. So as blood flows through the chambers, uh, we're gonna look at this. Okay, so the ventricles relax. When they do that, the pressure drops inside the ventricle. So the ventricle bottom chambers, as they ease and they, they're just sitting still and chilling, the semilunar valves close as blood attempts to back up into the ventricles from the vessels. The AV valves will open and the blood flows from the atria, top chambers down. Okay, you can almost look at it like we're, we're making lemonade here when we talk about the blood flow through the heart and how the chambers respond and open in response to pressure and volume. So when the ventricles contract, the AV valves will close. Okay, so the AV valves again, atrioventricular between the top and bottom chambers. We don't, when we, when we try to squeeze the lemonade out to go somewhere outside of the heart via contraction of the ventricles or the bottom chambers of the heart, the valves between the upstairs rooms and the downstairs rooms, those, those doors or those hatches to the attic, has, it has to be closed, right? So as the ventricle contracts, those valves close pretty tight. The pressure rises in the ventricles, and then the semilunar valves will, will open up in response to that so that they can so the blood can be pumped up and out of the heart. Okay, <clears throat> blood flow. You will need to know this in some capacity. So the blood enters through the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava. The superior vena cava is bringing you blood flow pretty much from the top part of the body, whereas the inferior is bringing you all your venous flow back from the bottom part of the body. And it's bringing you quote unquote dirty blood or less oxygenated blood. It's just going through an oxygen and nutrient transfer to the body tissues. So it's coming back to the heart for laundry day. It's getting cleaned. So it's gonna enter via the right atrium. The blood in that right atrium flows through the right AV valve into the right ventricle or into that bottom chamber. The contraction of the right ventricle will force that pulmonary valve, um, valve open. The blood flows through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. The blood is distributed by the right and left pulmonary arteries to their corresponding lung, where this is where our, our our big deal of uh, carbon oxygen or carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange will happen. This is how we do the laundry. This is where we do the cleaning. This is where we do the buffering. The blood returns from the lungs after it's been exchanged and cleaned up 
via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium of the heart. Blood in the left atrium will flow through the left AV valve into the left ventricle. The contraction of the left ventricle um, happens simultaneously with step three, by the way, forces that aortic valve open. Blood flows through the aortic valve into the ascending portion of the aorta. The blood in the aorta is distributed to every organ in the body where it unloads O2 and loads CO2. And then the circuit starts over. The blood returns to the heart via the vena cava. So the blood pathway travels again from the right atrium through the body and back to the starting point. 5% of the blood pumped by the heart is pumped to the heart itself through the coronary circulation. I mentioned that the coronary, when, we, when you hear coronary circulation, that is how the blood supply gets to the cardiac muscle itself. It begins with branches off of the aorta and supplies abundant oxygen and nutrients to that myocardial tissue. The blood flow to the heart muscle during ventricular contraction is slowed, unlike the rest of the body. Contraction of the myocardium compresses the coronary arteries and obstructs blood flow. Opening the aortic valve covers the openings to the coronary arteries, blocking blood flow into them. During ventricular relaxation, the blood in the aorta surges back toward the heart and into the openings of the coronary arteries. The blood flow to the myocardium increases during ventricular relaxation. The left coronary artery, or the LCA, branches off the ascending aorta. The anterior interventricular descending branch, this supplies blood to both ventricles and the anterior two-thirds of the interventricular septum. The circumflex branch passes around the left side of the heart in the coronary sulcus. It gives off left marginal branch and then ends on the posterior side of the heart. It supplies the left atrium and posterior wall of the left ventricle. The right coronary artery branches off the ascending aorta. It supplies the right atrium and the SA node or the pacemaker. The right marginal branch supplies the lateral aspect of the right atrium and ventricle. The posterior interventricular branch supplies the posterior walls of the ventricles. So again, if you follow the words of these guys, you're gonna be able to determine what goes where. Okay, here is a picture. There's the aorta and how it, um, blood supply to the heart is going to branch off this guy. There's our right coronary artery, left coronary artery. There's that circumflex artery, the left anterior descending artery. The interruption of blood supply to the heart from a blood clot or fatty deposit anatheroma in a coronary artery can cause the death of cardiac cells within minutes. Cardiac muscle downstream of the blockage will die. Heavy pressure or squeezing pain radiating into the, F, the to the left arm is an indicator of the um, infarction. Some painless heart attacks may disrupt electrical conduct conduction pathways, leading to fibrillation and cardiac arrest. Some protection from MI is provided by arterial anastomosis, which provides an alternative route of blood flow. And this is what we call collateral circulation. It kind of makes its own path. And this is done within the myocardium. And this is good news. And this is one of our protective mechanisms, just in case there's a block. So angina and heart attack. Angina pectoris is chest pain from parietal obstruction of coronary blood flow. <clears throat> The pain is caused by ischemia of cardiac muscle, obstruction that partially blocks the blood flow. The myocardium shifts to anaerobic fermentation, producing lactic acid and thus stimulating pain. Five to 10% drains directly into the right atrium and right ventricle by way of <clears throat> Excuse me, time out. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. 
Let's get back to this. Okay, so back to the venous drainage. Uh, let me start over here. 5% to 10% drains directly into the right atrium and right ventricle by way of the, the, the I'm not going to say that word right, <laughs> the Bezian veins. The rest returns to the right atrium by the great cardiac vein, it travels alongside the anterior intraventricular artery, and it collects blood from the anterior portion of the heart. The middle cardiac vein, or posterior intraventricular, is found in the posterior sulcus. It collects blood from the posterior portion of the heart. The left marginal vein collects blood from the left wall of the heart. The coronary sinus, this is in the coronary sulcus on the posterior side of the heart and collects blood from the coronary veins and empties into the right atrium. So here's our example of the venous supply. We can see evidence of the superior vena cava. We see that anterior cardiac vein. We see the smaller cardiac vein, the middle cardiac vein, uh, and the greater cardiac vein. We can also see um, the coronary sinus depicted here on the opposing side along with that small um, and middle cardiac vein. Okay, if you remember from last semester, we did investigate cardiac muscle tissue because it is um, muscle tissue, okay? Um, we can see that, and, and we know we went into to muscle, how muscle works. Um, cardiac muscle being its own little thing, having some neat identifying markers, the biggest one being those intercalated discs. Now, um, cardiac muscle can branch, one cell can branch. Um, and again, those intercalated discs will be our primary indicator of, what, of being able to identify that. So cardiocytes are striated, short, thick, branched cells with one central nu nucleus. The intercalated disc joins cardiocytes end to end. Interdigitating folds, folds um, that interlock with each other and increase the surface area of contact. These intercalated discs are electrical junctions or gap junctions. They allow ions to flow between cells and they can stimulate neighbors. The entire myocardium of either two atria or two ventricles acts like a single unified cell. And that's due to these intercalated discs. Um, they're required for the I would say coordination of the conductivity principle of the entire unit in and of itself. So repair of damage of cardiac muscles almost entirely by fibrosis or scarring. Okay, so here's just some more structure of that cardiac muscle. We can see evidence of the striations, the nucleus, and the intercalating discs. So cardiac muscle depends almost exclusively on aerobic respiration used to make ATP. It's rich in myoglobin and glycogen. They have huge mitochondria that fill about 25% of the cell. Now think about that. If we understand that the mitochondria are the powerhouses and where the, the largest portion of the ATP is produced, this these cells need to be you know, on point in their production of energy for the contraction in this whole entire system to function. So by design, very intricate and amazing. Uh, adaptable to organic fuels, fatty acids, glucose, ketones, lactic acid, and amino acids. Um, it's more vulnerable to oxygen deficiency than the lack of a specific fuel. It's fatigue resistant because it makes little use of anaerobic fermentation or oxygen jet debt mechanisms does not fatigue for an entire lifetime uh, and if we see that happening like we talked about with the angina you know it's the it's when if if it does go into an anaerobic respirative state it's because something's off so the conduction system of the heart this coordinates the heartbeat and is con Posed of an internal pacemaker and nerve-like conduction pathway through the myocardium. Okay, so <clears throat> the conduction system of the heart, pretty awesome. This is evidence that we, just another evidence that we are electrical. So if you ever doubt electric, <laughs> the value of understanding electricity, I encourage you to, to explore a little bit deeper uh, um, on how this all works. And again, when we have our foundations in electricity, that's physics, 
So um, physics goes into uh, movement of particles, visible and invisible light spectrum stuff and how that impacts the system. It's not separate. So anything that you would call not able to happen just because you can't explain it, um, I would encourage you to look into electricity and quantum physics because, I mean, this is not necessarily, this is a, uh, not necessarily quantum physics, this is just physics, but quantum physics gives us some other answers as well. Anyway, back to the conduction system of the heart. It generates conducts rhythmic electrical signals in this order. It goes to, it kind of starts at what's the called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. Um, these are modified cardiocytes. This is the pacemaker that initiates each heartbeat that sets the heart rate. It is located within the right atrium near the base of the superior vena cava. The signals spread then throughout the atria. The AV node or the atrioventricular node, you can tell where it is by the name, is located near the right AV valve at the lower end of the interatrial septum. The electrical gateway to the ventricles, that's what this guy is. The fibrous skeleton, it's an uh, insulator, prevents the currents from getting <clears throat> to the ventricles by any other route, okay? Again, we're talking electrical conductivity principles here. The AV bundle, or the bundle of his, okay, um, is part of the system. This bundle forks into right and left bundle branches. The branches pass through the interventricular septum toward the apex. Then we have what's called the Purkinje fibers. These are nerve-like processes that spread throughout the ventricular myocardium where the signal passes from cell to cell through the gap junctions. So here you go. Very nice picture. Get familiar with where everything lies. There's um, that the SA node, this is how it starts. It fires its electrical impulse. The exc excitation spreads through the atrial myocardium. The AV node then gets triggered and fires. Then the excitation spreads down the AV bundle. The Purkinje fibers distribute excitation through the ventricular myocardium. Okay, so the nerve supply to the heart. Let's talk about this. The sympathetic nerves will raise the heart rate. The cardiac centers in the medulla will send signals to the lower cervical slash upper thoracic segments of the spinal cord. So you need to understand how very, very important lower cervical and upper thoracic um, segments of the vertebra vertebral alignment and compression factors are in this pathway which makes you know, um, the validity of body work very, very apparent here, not just for pain signals, because again, if we remember from last semester when we talked about neurology, very few or very little portion of the nervous system can actually detect pain. They're doing something much higher level. So the, these sympathetic nerves, they continue to adjacent sympathetic chain ganglia and the cardiac plexus and the mediastinum. This continues as cardiac nerves to the heart. The fibers terminate in the SE and AV nodes in the atrial and ventricular myocardium, as well as the aorta, the pulmonary trunk, and coronary arteries. <clears throat> It increases the heart rate and contraction strength. It dilates the coronary arteries, increasing myocardial blood flow. So the parasympathetic nervous control then to the heart, which will slow the heart rate. The pathway begins with the nuclei of vagus nerves in the medulla. It extends to the cardiac plexus and continues to the heart by way of the cardiac nerves. The fibers of the vagus nerve lead to the SA node and the AV node. There's little or no vagal stimulation to the myocardium. The parasympathetic stimulation reduces the heart rate. Valsalva's maneuver may reduce heart rate um, or, or vagal down. Um, so 
Valsalva's maneuver. If you've not heard of this, this is almost like it's taking your head out of it. You get distracted in order to bring the heart rate down or we do something to uh, some sort of maneuver which will uh, stimulate um, and downregulate that um, sympathetic response and pull in the parasympathetic stimulation to reduce the heart rate. If I remember correctly, and I think this is kind of weird, if you push on your eyeballs, that's supposed to reduce your heart rate. <laughs> Not hard, don't push on them hard. Okay, um, let's look at the electrical contractile activity of the heart. And let's see if I can pop this um, YouTube video up and see if it'll play. This one might, I, oh, no, maybe not. I don't know what this means. Let's see. I might ruin my entire video by doing this. Let's see. Okay. So this is amazing because this is a beating heart outside of a body. like its own thing. Super cool, right? Okay, I think that is uh, fabulous in regards to that. Um, so we can understand that that electrical impulse, ion driven by the way, okay, ion mineral driven again we're going to point to some nutrients uh for for these electrical conductivity principles if if a person's mineral balance is out of whack or their hydration is imbalanced that imbalances the entire system or if you know we have some other contributing factors to inflammatory processes throughout the body where um these electrical conduct are being used elsewhere and used up and may not be available for what they need to do. That's a big deal. So I think all of that needs to be inspected. <clears throat> okay, the sinus rhythm is the normal rate triggered by the SA node. It's set by the SA node at 60 to 100 beats per minute. An adult at rest is 70 to 80, and that's what we call vagal tone. Ectopic focus, another part of the heart fires before the SA node. Uh, the nodal rhythm, if the SA node is damaged, the heart rate is set by the AV node at 40 to 50 beats per minute. The intrinsic ventricular rhythm, if both the SA and AV nodes are not functioning, the rate is set at 20 to 40 beats per minute and may require a pacemaker to sustain life. So an arrhythmia, any abnormal cardiac rhythm, I've heard that. It's failure of the conduction system to transmit signals. <clears throat> uh, um, they might do a bundle branch block or total heart block damage to the uh, AV node. They might do this on purpose or these just might inherently become damaged thereby not being able to control the rhythm. Atrial flutter, the ectopic foci in the atria. Atrial fibrillation, we call that AFib. Uh, the atria beat 200 to 400 times per minute. Um, it might be premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. This is caused by stimulants, stress, or lack of sleep. Um, this can also be contributed to some of these things, and I would, I think it's more the, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, pre the PVCs. Um, actually, maybe not. It might be, um, it might be the NSA note. It might be a true arrhythmia. You, if your adrenal glands and thyroid gland are not functioning well, you can have arrhythmias produced and heart flip floppies. Okay, that flutter. So something that needs inspected if indeed there is an arrhythmia present. 
Okay, so VFib, this is a serious arrhythmia caused by electrical signals reaching different regions at different times. So although that cardiac muscle is intended to work as one unit, this is where it gets out of whack. The heart cannot pump the blood and no coronary perfusion. It kills quickly if it's not stopped. So this is uh, where we use defibrillation, those, you know, the pads, strong electrical shock to depolarize the entire myocardium and reset the SA nodes to sinus rhythm. So you know, having a big, strong uh, stimulus to kind of, when we talk about repolarization and depolarization, so we get the ions moving all at the same time in the same direction. <clears throat> the SA node does not have a stable RMP. It starts at a negative 60 millivolts and drifts upward from a slow inflow of sodium. The gradual depolarization is called pacemaker potential, slow inflow of sodium without compensating outflow of potassium. When it reaches threshold of negative 40 millivolts, the voltage gated fast calcium and sodium channels open. The faster depolarization occurs peaking at zero millivolts. The potassium channels then open uh, and potassium leaves the cell, causing repolarization once potassium channels closed, the pacemaker potential starts over. Each depolarization of the SA node sets off one heartbeat at rest and fires every 0.8 seconds or 75 beats per minute. <clears throat> so here you go with the uh, pacemaker portion and the physiology of how that works in regards to sodium, potassium, and calcium. So we're seeing the requirement of these minerals. This is what I've been talking about. Minerals, how they are electrical conductors. These guys are a big deal. And when we get into situations where we're finding that your body's pulling these minerals out of storage, aka osteoporotic situations, I think it's valuable to investigate where they're going. Okay, so impulse conduction to the myocardium. It gets the signal from the SA node, which stimulates the two atria to contract almost simultaneously. The signal slows down through the AV node, delays the signal, which allows the ventricles to fill. The signal travels very quickly through the AV bundle and Purkinje fibers. The entire ventricular myocardium depolarizes or contracts in unison. The papillary muscles contract an instant earlier than the rest, tightening slack in the chordae tendinae, which close the AV valves. Ventricular systole progresses up from the apex of the heart. The spiral arrangement of those cardiocytes um, twists ventricular slightly, like someone wringing a towel. Cardiocytes have a stable resting potential of negative 90 millivolts and depolarize only when stimulated by the conduction system. The depolarization uh, phase, this is the stimulus, uh, uh, opens the voltage regulated sodium gates, sodium rushes in. The membrane depolarizes and peaks at a positive 30 millivolts. And the plateau phase, this sustains the contraction for the expulsion of blood. The calcium channels are slow to close, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is slow to remove the calcium from the cytosol. The potassium channels open, but contraction is maintained because of the inflow of the calcium. So in the repolarization phase, the calcium channels close, potassium channels open, and there is a rapid diffusion of potassium out of this out of the cell and returns it to its resting potential. And here we go again. Electrical behavior of the mitocardium. <clears throat> it starts with that voltage gated sodium channel opens. The sodium inflow depolarizes the membrane and triggers the opening of still more sodium channels, creating a positive feedback cycle and a rapidly rising membrane voltage. The sodium channel will close when the cell depolarizes and the voltage peaks at nearly positive 30 millivolts. Calcium entering through the slow calcium channels prolong depolarization of the membrane, creating a plateau. 
The plateau falls slightly because of some potassium leakage, but most potassium channels will remain closed until the end of the plateau. The calcium channels close and calcium is transported out of the cell. Potassium channels open and rapid potassium outflow returns the membrane to its resting potential. <coughs> Okay, so the electrocardiogram, or the ECG, or a key EKG, this is a composite of all action potentials of nodal and myocardial cells detected, amplified, and recorded by electrodes on arms, legs, and chest. When we're looking at an electrocardiogram, we're going to look at the P wave. The P wave signifies uh, when the SA node fires, the atria depolarize and contract. The atrial systole begins at 100 milliseconds after the SA node. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization and masks atrial repolarization. The ST segment or ventricular systole represents um, the plateau in myocardial action potential. The T wave is ventricular repolarization and relaxation. So here we go with investigation of the P wave. <clears throat> that QRS segment, the QT interval and the T wave. So here we go. Atrial depolarization begins when we're looking at this. This is the atria depolarized. That's our P wave. This is a nice picture, by the way, for explanation of this process. Atrial, when atrial depolarization is complete, the um, atria are contracted. Then ventricular depolarization begins at the apex and progresses superiorly as the atria repolarize. The ventricular depolarization is complete and the ventricles are contracted. The ventricles begin to repolarize at the apex. Ventricular repolarization is complete and the ventricles are relaxed. abnormalities in the conduction um, pathways. These are evident, we can see some differences here. The top picture shows us a nor normal rhythm. And the bottom picture um, is a nodal rhythm with no SA node activity. You can see that there's no, we don't see the P wave in this guy. We might see this in myocardial infarctions, heart enlargement, electrolyte, and hormone imbalances. Okay, so when we talk about blood flow, heart sounds, and the cardiac cycle, this is what we're gonna talk about. So the cardiac cycle is one complete contraction and relaxation of all four chambers of the heart. Atrial systole or contraction occurs while the ventricles are in diastole or relaxation. Atrial diastole occurs while the ventricles are in systole. The quiescent period is when all four chambers are relaxed at the same time. Opening and closing of the valves are governed by the pressure changes. When the ventricle relaxes, and expands, its internal pressure falls, then blood flows into the ventricle. The AV valves are limp when the ventricles are relaxed. The semilunar valves under pressure from the blood vessels, from blood in the vessels when the ventricles are relaxed. When the ventricle contracts, the internal pressure rises, the AV valves close, and the semilunar valves are pushed open. 
and the blood flows into the vessels, the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. So we kind of talked about this already, <clears throat> about how the valves open and close, depending on where the blood is in transit within the heart. So auscultation is the listening to the sounds made by the body. The first heart sound is what we call S1. It's louder and longer and we call it a lub and occurs with the closure of the AV valves, turbulence in the bloodstream and movements of the wall of the heart. The second heart sound we call S2. It's softer and sharper. It's a, a dub, lub dub. It occurs with the closure of the semilunar valves, turbulence in the bloodstream, and movements of the heart wall. So the S1 is AV valve closure, S2, semilunar valve closure. Phases of the cardiac cycle. First comes ventricular filling, then comes isovolumetric contraction, ventricular ejection, and isovolumetric relaxation. All the events in the cardiac cycle are completed in less than a second. So ventricular filling. During diastole, the ventricles expand. The pressure drops below that of the atria. The AV valves open and blood flows into the ventricles. It occurs in three phases. There's rapid ventricular filling. This is the first one third. The blood enters very quickly. Diastasis is the second one third, which is marked by slower filling. And then atrial systole is the final one third where the atria contract. End diastolic volume or EVV is the amount of blood contained in each ventricle at the end of ventricular filling. Isovolumetric contraction happens, at, um, this is the, when the atria repolarize and they remain in diastole for the rest of the cycle. The ventricles depolarize and create the QRS complex and then begin to contract. The AV valves close as ventricular blood surges back against the cusp. The heart sound S1 occurs at the beginning of this phase. It's called isovolumetric because even though the ventricles contract, they do not eject blood. The AV valves will close, the semilunar valves are still closed. So the, because the pressure in the aorta, which is 80 millimeters of mercury, and in the pulmonary trunk, which is 10, is still greater than that in the ventricles. The cardiocytes exert force, but with all four valves closed, the blood can't go anywhere. So during ventricular ejection, this begins when the ventricular pressure exceeds arterial pressure and forces the semilunar valves open. It corresponds to the plateau phase of the cardiac action potential, or the T wave occurs late in this phase. Stroke volume of about 70 milliliters of blood is ejected of the 130 milliliters in each ventricle. The ejection fraction of a, is a uh, of about 54%. It can be as high as 90 in vigorous exercise. The end systolic volume, uh, this is 60 milliliters of blood that's left behind. Isovolumetric relaxation, when the T wave ends and the ventricles begin to expand. Elastic recoil and expansion causes pressure to drop and suck blood back into the ventricles. The blood from the aorta and pulmonary trunk, trunk briefly flows backward, filling the semilunar valves and closing the cusp. Heart sound S2 occurs as blood hits the closed semilunar valves and, and, the, ventric, and the ventricle expands. 
uh, ISO volume, this is considered ISO volumetric because the semilunar valves are closed and the AV valves have not opened yet. The ventricles are therefore taking in the blood. When the AV valves open, ventricular filling begins again. An arresting person, atrial systole lasts about 0.1 seconds. Ventricular systole lasts about 0.3. And the quiescent period when all four chambers are in diastole is about 0.4 seconds. The total duration of the cardiac cycle is therefore 0.8 seconds and the heart beating 75 beats per minute. So here's um, another uh, picture or graph that may help um, you kind of correlate all of these pieces of the picture together a little bit better. There's the ventricular filling isovolumetric contraction, ventricular ejection, and isovolumetric relaxation. So here's just, I'll let you guys look at this on your own when you can look over the volume changes and, and how, it, how it works um, as far as um, how the blood that the heart is holding and then what it is ejecting um, through each portion or um, some of the phases that it's going through. Okay, so the right uh, ventricular output exceeds the left ventricular output when we're looking at the overall volume changes. The pressure then will back up and fluid accumulates in the pulmonary tissue. In left ventricular, and this is happening in left ventricular failure, the blood backs up into the lungs causing pulmonary edema. There's a shortness of breath or a sense of suffocation. In right ventricular failure, the blood backs up in the vena cava causing systemic or generalized edema. This can be from enlargement of the liver or ascites, which is pulling of fluid in the abdominal cavity, distension of the jugular veins, swelling of the fingers, ankles, and feet. Eventually, this leads to total heart failure. When we talk about CS, CHF, or congestive heart failure, this results from the failure of either ventricle to eject blood effectively. This is usually due to a heart that's weakened by myocardial infarction, chronic hypertension, valvular insufficiency, or congenital defects in heart structure. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about my grandfather, though, who went into congestive heart failure, and I really think it was broken heart syndrome, and that is a recognized thing now. Um, his wife, my grandmother died about a year prior to him. I believe it was about a year, maybe it was two, but he just, it was like, he could not recover. He was <laughs> healthy. Uh, very few medications, very low requirement for anything to go on, but it's like it all happened. It all kind of compiled in it at that time. So emotions do contribute to this stuff, guys. They are not separate from your physiology. Okay, so we're going to get into cardiac output because you're going to have to uh, learn this and then uh, in class we'll go over more of it so you um, have an understanding of the equations and how it's done and because you will be quizzed on your understanding of this knowledge. So cardiac output is the amount ejected by the ventricle in one minute. Cardiac output is the heart rate times the stroke volume about four to six liters per minute at rest. Vigorous exercise increases um, cardiac output to 21 liters per minute for a fit person and up to 35 liters per minute for a world-class athlete. The cardiac reserve, that is the difference between a person's maximum and resting cardiac output. It increases with fitness and decreases with disease. To keep cardiac output constant as we increase in age, the heart rate increases as the stroke volume decreases. Pulse, that is the pressure produced by each heartbeat that can be felt by palpating a superficial artery. Infants have a heart rate of 120 beats per minute or more. Young adults, 64 to 80, and there are rises in the elderly. Tachycardia is a rapid heartbeat. Uh, the resting adult heart rate above 100 beats per minute is classified as tachycardia. Stress, anxiety, drugs, heart disease, or fever can lead to this, and there are probably a million other causes. 
um, also loss of blood or damage to the myocardium can create this. Bradycardia in the resting heart rate is defined as anything under 60 beats per minute. Uh, this happens in sleep with low body temperature and endurance trained athletes. This uh, positive chronotropic agents, these are factors that raise the heart rate, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, or negative chronotropic tropic agents are factors that lower the heart rate, like ACH and beta blockers. So chronotropic effects of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system does not initiate the heartbeat. It modulates rhythm and force. Cardiostimulatory effect is uh, when some neurons of the cardiac center transmit signals to the heart by way of sympathetic pathways. Um, the cardio inhibitory effect, other, um, others transmit parasympathetic signals by way of the vagus nerve. So chronotropic effects of the ANS. Sympathetic postganglionic fibers are adrenergic and they release norepinephrine. They bind to beta adrenergic fibers in the heart opening, um, which is the opening of uh, calcium channels in the plasma membrane. Increased calcium inflow accelerates the depolarization of the SA node. This accelerates the uptake of calcium by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing the cardiocytes to relax more quickly. By accelerating both contraction and relaxation, norepinephrine increases the heart rate as high as 230 beats per minute. The parasympathetic vagus nerve, they have cholinergic inhibitory effects on the SA and AV nodes. Acetylcholine, or ACH, binds to the muscarinic receptors and opens potassium <clears throat> gates in the nodal cells. As potassium leaves the cells, they become hyperpolarized and fire less frequently, and the heart rate slows. Without influence from the cardiac centers, the heart has an intrinsic natural firing rate of 100 beats per minute. The vagal tone holds the heart rate down to 70 to 80 beats per minute at rest due to steady background firing rate of the vagus nerves. The cardiac centers in the medulla, they receive input from many sources and regulate heart rate accordingly. The cerebral cortex limbic system hypothalamus, these guys affect the heart rate by responding to sensory or emotional stimuli. Proprial receptors and the muscles and joints. These inform cardiac centers about changes in activity. Heart rate increases before metabolic demands of muscle arise. The baroreceptors, these are pressure sensors in the aorta and internal carotid arteries, and the heart rate will increase or decrease based on the pressure needs. The chemoreceptors in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries and the medulla, these guys are sensitive to blood pH, carbon dioxide, and oxygen levels. <clears throat> Stroke volume. The other factor in cardiac output besides the heart rate is the stroke volume. There are three, three variables that govern stroke volume. There are preload, contractility, and afterload. Examples, increased preload or contractility will increase the stroke volume. An increased afterload decreases the stroke volume. So preload, this is the amount of tension in the ventricular myocardium immediately before it begins to contract. Increased preload causes increased force of contraction. Exercise increases the venous return and stretches the myocardium. Cardiocytes generate more tension during contraction. The increased cardiac output matches the increased venous return. So the Frank Starling law of the heart. Stroke volume. <clears throat> is gonna have an impact on the end diastolic volume. Stroke volume is proportional to the end diastolic volume. The ventricles eject as much blood as they receive. The more they are stretched, the harder they contract. Contractility refers to how hard the myocardium contracts for a given preload. Positive inotropic agents increase the contractility. Hypercalcemia can cause strong, prolonged contractions and even cardiac arrest in systole. 
catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. They increase calcium levels. Digitalis raises intracellular calcium levels and, construct and contraction strength. Afterload. Blood pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, immediately distal to the semilunar valves. This opposes the opening of these valves and limits the stroke volume. Hypertension increases afterload and opposes ventricular ejection. Anything that impedes arterial circulation can also increase afterload, including diseases that restrict pulmonary circulation. Poor pulmonale, this is right ventricular failure due to an obstructed pulmonary circulation. <clears throat> in emphysema, this happens in emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and black lung disease. So exercise makes the heart work harder, increases cardiac, and increases cardiac output. Proprioceptors signal the cardiac center. At the beginning of exercise, signals from joints and muscles reach the cardiac center of the brain. Sympathetic output from the cardiac centers increases cardiac output. So there's increased much muscular activity, increases the venous return. It increases preload and ultimately cardiac output. Increases in heart rate and stroke volume cause an increase in cardiac output. Exercise produces ventricular hypertrophy. There's an increased stroke volume that allows the heart to beat more slowly at rest. Athletes with increased cardiac reserve can tolerate more exertion than a sedentary person. So vascular insufficiency or incompetence is a failure of a valve to prevent reflux or regurgitation or that backward flow of the blood. You see this in valvular stenosis where the cusps are stiffened and opening is constricted by scar tissue. This may be a result of rheumatic fever or autoimmune attack on the valves of the heart. The heart murmur, which is an abnormal heart sound produced of, by regurgitation of the blood through incompetent valves. The mitral valve prolapses insufficiency in which one or both mitral valve cusp bulge into the atria during ventricular contraction. Coronary artery disease, or CAD, is a constriction of coronary arteries, usually the result of atherosclerosis and accumulation of lipid deposits that degrade the arterial wall and obstruct the lumen. The endothelium may become damaged by hypertension, virus, diabetes, or other causes. Um, they absorb cholesterol and look like fatty streak on the vessel walls. These can grow into atherosclerotic plaques or atheromas. Um, bulging masses may grow to obstruct arterial lumen as well. Um, so when we talk about coronary artery disease, the causes may be uh, in part due to angina pectoris, that intermittent chest pain by obstructing 75% or more of the blood flow. The immune cells of atheroma stimulate inflammation. They may rupture, resulting in traveling clots or fatty emboli. Cause these um, uh, may cause coronary artery spasms due to the lack of secretion of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Inflammation transforms atheroma into a hardened, complicated plaque called atherosclerosis. Uh, unavoidable risk factors contributing to coronary artery, artery disease are heredity, aging, um, and being a male. Preventable risk factors, obesity, smoking, lack of exercise, anxious personality, stress, uh, aggression, and diet. The treatment may be coronary bypass surgery, surgery through the great saphenous vein, balloon angioplasty, and laser angioplasty. Okay, gang, that's all I have to say about that. Um, in accordance with this lecture, we will also do more on the cardiac um, output so that you understand how to look at that and evaluate that. And this will be the basis for your next quiz. Have a great day.